Well, welcome everyone to this uh, Practicing for Peace experiential session led by uh, story activist Mary Alice Arthur and a team of people from the Art of Hosting community. Um, this is part of the Coming Down to Earth Summit on Conflict Transformation that began June 15th and wraps up next Wednesday, July 15th. And uh, I'm excited to have you all here. And please do stay on mute when you're not speaking. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary Alice Arthur to take us away for the next two hours. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, Practicing for Peace, Working with Stories for Conflict Transformation. It's a delight to me that I could email Toka and say to him, do you want to play? And he said, yes. So as those of you who know me would know, I'm very interested in how story works around the world and most specifically how we can become very conscious about how our stories are either holding us down or lifting us up we can use stories to create a new story for the future. So it's always very interesting for me to listen out for great stories of practice that could help us to find ways that we can actually be with simple and very potent um, practices, helping people to create capacity, to build capacity in others to help us practice for peace. And I wanna thank Toka Muller for being here and being our storyteller for today with one of his lived uh, experiences Today we are going to listen to his story and we're going to then go into trios and actually practice what we've been talking about for real to see how it works. And then we want to be in some conversation about applying this work and where it can go in the future and hear back from you what you feel excited about and what are some of the next steps you think you might take. Our purpose is to be very, very much looking at building capacity and for being very practical because these times are calling for us to lead with both head, heart, and hands. That's a good Danish model, so I'm glad to have my Danish colleague here with me. The Folk High School Movement in Denmark talks about head, heart, and hands and how all of those need to be activated in order to move forward. So before we move into that, just reminding you for a bit of netiquette, if you could, as we asked earlier, keep yourself muted if you're not speaking, just because those of us at home have life happening, and I, for one, have been delighted to see life happening. I love meeting the kids and the dogs and everything else. Um, but whatever is going on in your environment, it may offer you an opportunity to be in practice. Secondly, if you remember on the upper right hand part of your Zoom panel, you have the opportunity to choose either speaker view or gallery view. So if you want to see whoever is speaking in the large view, please choose speaker view. And if you'd like to see all of us on the screen currently, there are 43 people on this call, 44 people, someone just came in. Um, then you might want to choose gallery view and see some of the wonderful people who've joined us from around the planet. And we're about to find out who those are. So before we go further, Toka, if you could just wave a moment. So Toka is going to be our, our storyteller for today, my art of hosting colleague, mate, and mentor. We also have um, Henrik and um, Macha and Yanis, who are our harvesting team. The three of them are going to be looking at what we put into the chat window and seeing what we can learn from each other as we're going on. And Carlotta is going to be our graphic harvester. She is going to be capturing what we're doing in visual form. So afterwards we have some good pictures and remembrance of what we talked about today. So those are the other people who are joining us. So let's go into a bit of a check in. Here's the question. Ben has put it in the chat window. Where do your feet touch the ground? And what is alive in your life right now that compelled you to be here today? I want to invite you to answer both of those questions before you hit send or return so that they both stay together. So where do your feet touch the ground? And what is alive in your life right now that compelled you to be here today? Could you please share with us and write something in the chat window so we can see who's here? So we've also got the instruction, we're all going to press enter at the same time. So we'll wait for it. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. <laughs> so please write, yeah, please write whatever you're going to write. And then we'll have a three, two, one countdown and everybody press send. That's called a Zoom bomb, interestingly enough, I learned at some point in time. I didn't know that. So where do your feet touch the ground? What is it in your life that is that wanted you to be here today? So please write both those things before you 
enter it into the chat window. Okay. So I'm going to consider if you haven't yet, let's do three, two, one, and done. Woohoo! Look at that. So I want to ask people to just scan if you've already entered in the chat window, just scan back and see where people are from and some of the reasons that they are here. I want to ask for a few people to look through the chat and give us some of the themes they see. What themes are you seeing about why people decided to be here? So just to start us off, Yanis, can I call on you and just invite you to share some theme, one of the themes you're seeing here about why people decided to join us? So, um, okay, um, I got in the middle of the bombing and you know what happens when you're in the middle of the bombing. Uh, so what I get is, uh, one thing I get is practicing. So people love to be here in order to learn something that they can practice in their everyday life. The topic itself, it's quite compelling by definition about working on conflict resolution. Um, I can say what structures st struck me. So the word reframing and learning from Tanya. I love that as well. Curiosity. These are some things that I see here. Taking knowledge, bringing knowledge, transferring knowledge to my communities. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anybody else who sees some themes that would like to name them? Looking for one or two other voices. What themes are you seeing about why people decided to say yes to this? I had people set so they couldn't unmute themselves, but now you can. <laughs> That's always handy for asking for some voices, right? <laughs> and you can use the raise hand feature under uh, participants or if you the three dots next to your name and we can see you and call on you also. I'm just going to barge in. Uh, I see a lot of love. I love. Mm, I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. Anyone else seeing some themes that are interesting? It might also yes, be Alex. Uh, uh, Alex. <laughs> I was. I wanted to say that we are in a very strange time. So I, I hear a lot of silence, but it's a silence that requires peace working because it's not a quiet silence for at least where I am. So I'm here to learn for that, Thank to you. deal with the, the, the yeah. loud silence. The loud silence. And Sabina, you were going to say? that I also saw some um, peace, peace and healing um, came, got my attention as well. So. Mm, thank you very much. So we're coming from right around the world and we are coming with um, some concerns on the mind and heart from what we're seeing around the place. And we're hoping that stories can help us. So to that end, I want to invite my mate and colleague Toka Muller to join me in a bit of storytelling and story sharing about a certain time in his life. And I want to, we're gonna do that by doing a sort of a little interview together. We have often had the, the great pleasure of hosting in the art of hosting together and, and uh, what we call cracking on patterns, meaning sitting in the deep work together and really seeing what the juice of it is and where it's leading us and how we can keep practicing to build capacity. So that's what we want to invite you into today. We're going to hear a bit from Toka about practicing peace in the Ivory Coast. That's where we're going to lead to. And then after that, we're going to go into trios and have some work with that. So welcome, Toka. Thank you so much for saying yes, for playing with me. I want to start off this little storytelling by, by taking you, oh, you're getting a suntan while we're talking. That's really nice. Uh, by, by inviting you to kind of go way back in your history, because as I recall you talking about your childhood, there was a certain moment when you learned something about power. And I'm wondering if that's one of the seeds of the trajectory of your life. So could you take us back to the time you were in school? 
You're on mute, I think, are you? Yes, you're muted at the moment. Hello, everyone. Thank you for showing up. Um, you know, I am uh, born in a family here in Denmark who were part of the resistance movement in uh, the Second World War. Um, my father joined the resistance in 42, and that implicated my mother to be back up, my uncle as well. And as the war ended and my parents were lucky not to be uh, physically hurt, because being in the resistance was a very dangerous business. <clears throat> uh, so part of the way I was brought up was it's important to do whatever we can, never for such a horrible thing as the Second World War to happen again. I was born in 48, and somehow there was no teaching me to hate the Germans who had occupied us for five years. There was an understanding that had happened, but now we needed to move on. I entered school, uh, and in fifth grade, uh, we have a new guy coming into class, and um, he uh, was big, I was small. Somehow, he thought I was a very irritating little brat, and he would beat me in the mouth uh, every uh, morning uh, for uh, 14 days. I fought him back the first days, but then he beat me some more. I had braces on. I came back to my home every day with the bleeding uh, lips and mouth. But I was a very proud little fellow. And uh, my father said, what is that? Uh, what's happening? And first I wouldn't tell. And then I told him after a few days, and he said, instead of saying, where does that guy live? I would go, my father was a sharpshooter in the Royal Guard. He was a blacksmith, an engineer, and also had been in the uh, uh, thick of the resistance movement. So, but he was not a violent man. And he, uh, he said, instead of going and talking to the parents or beating up the guy, he said, Toga, you need to train something. It was a very significant moment in my life. I said, Dad, what? And he said, I don't know, but we will find something. And two weeks later, we found the first Jiu Jitsu Japanese self defense uh, dojo for kids in Copenhagen. And I began to train there. Um, I learned in two or three months how I could have broken the arms and legs of that boy. I never used it on him. He never knew I was practicing it, but two years later, he, no, one, half a year later, he became my friend. He came to our home. Two years later, uh, when we were good friends, he volunteered that the reason that he uh, behaved like that and had beaten me up. And he actually apologized one evening sitting around the fire uh, and listening to another friend who could play guitar and we were having good friendship harmony. He apologized and then he told us that the reason he was beating people up was his father beat him up at least once a week. And from this experience, I was 10 years old, I realized two or three things. One is that there are practices from which, if I practice them sincerely, they have an outer effect, technique. But something happened in me as strength to not be afraid of the bullying. 
And it took me about 40 years until I began to practice Aikido in the age of 40, that I realized that actually I had learned besides these techniques to befriend an enemy and had become my friend. And I thought, and I still think, these kind of practices are important. And, uh, and the second thing I learned was that a dojo where you can practice technique, you can also practice life practice and build your character and strength to stand for who you are in the world without having to brag about it, just to be yourself. And, uh, and it has been very forming, you know, the, the understanding that I had, if I wanted to find, first I wanted self-defense, but I realized in the process that I had begun to experience a certain level of peace and willingness to be open-hearted enough to receive this guy who had been beating me up with friendship. And uh, from there on, it has grown. So uh, two threads that are occurring to me. Um, one is this thread of personal practice that seems to have continued throughout the whole of your life. And secondly, that question of practicing peace itself. How has that shown up in your life? I remember us having in conversation a, a long time ago about that you had had a, an inquiry about trust. And I said to you, what have you learned about trust? And you said, I learned that, that to, to be trusted first, I must be trustworthy. And that's always stuck with me ever since. Mm. I remember that. <laughs> it's again the shift mm. in perspective, you know, being in the stance between my inner life and my outer life which I think is something we all share. And the more self-aware we can be and the more conscious we can be and the more in the moment we can be, we can see the inner and the outer clear, more clearly. And for a long time when I couldn't, it was blurred. I was always looking at who are people I can trust. And then I think what happened uh, mm. you're relating to years and I realized that maybe I had some homework to do, like I had homework to do with Jiu Jitsu, to learn how to, to not be afraid. And learn, I became a weapon. But I used the weapon not to fight back. Mm -hmm. And so I realized maybe it would be worth looking for, am I a man or a human being that can be trusted? Mm -hmm. And since then, I realized there is something I can do. This is like a practice. Do I live my life in a respectful way towards myself, towards nature, towards other people, without being a dogma or some, you know, trying to be a good de doer or something, but just in, in, in You know, I want to add maybe something else here before we go into the actual story of Cote d'Ivoire. And I don't quite remember that moment, but there is a... Uh, it's actually coming out of the... It's a teaching, it's a wisdom practice. Uh, it comes out of the, uh, the Mahabharata, the Indian, uh, you know, wisdom Stop, enormous story. <laughs> There's a story for you. But part of it I have, you know, uh, uh, read um, when I was younger and also I have been extracting this little teaching. And there's a moment where this woman, she's a young princess and she is told for seen to be the initiator of war. Everybody says, you will be the reason for the big war, the Mahabharata. And she's 16 years old, she freaks out. She doesn't want to be, you know, the reason. And so she goes seeking for some wisdom. 
she finds a guy who is known to be wise. He has a little booth in the market. She leaves the palace. She goes down and she, yeah, here you are, a wise guy. What uh, can you help me? Because they all everybody's telling me I'll be the reason for the big war, and I don't want to be. I just want to live my life peacefully. So he says it's very easy if you practice these three things. First, don't offend anybody. First practice, don't offend anybody. Second practice, if, if people try to offend you, don't get offended. Even if they try to offend you, don't get offended. And third practice is, don't take revenge. And she's put to the test she can't practice it, and the war erupts. And if you want to know more, read the Mahabharata. And you have a story for the rest of your life, I think. But I realize now, and I hadn't seen this before, Ma, I realize now that's exactly what I popped into in my little story of this guy, Klaus, who beat me up. I learned to find a place in myself on the mat in Jiu-Jitsu with a really good sensei who was a kind man. He was not a, let's be, I'll teach you how to beat the monk kind of consciousness. He was a peaceful man. He was a police officer that taught the Copenhagen police uh, the essence of Jiu-Jitsu. And Jiu-Jitsu is one of the streams into Aikido, which I then picked up later on, which is known as a practice of peace. Mm. So, he offended me, certainly. I did get offended, but I, and then I fought back. I realized I better not get offended. I took another path. And then when I got the capacity to beat him up, I didn't use it. I didn't take revenge. I offered him tea. <laughs> it was my mom's great thing. She would always invite us for tea. That's how she tamed these young teenagers. Anyway. Okay, so let's fast forward to this particular project. Obviously, there's been a, a pathway and some of you are invited to be part of this project in the Ivory Coast. How did that come about and what was going on? So 2002, there's a civil war, uh, political instigated in Cote d'Ivoire. I don't know anything about it. 2011, uh, something like this erupts. 3,000 people are being killed. And it's uh, horrible for the people of Cote d'Ivoire because they are, you know, I, I heard stories when we got there that people had actually living in the same uh, apartment block, having been, you know, living harmoniously together as Cote d'Ivoireans, as this erupts by some political precedents wanting to maintain their power and the other one wanted it, instigated with, you know, some uh, fanatic wives uh, with religious uh, 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 energy behind that judgment of the other and everything, this war erupts. Nobody wants it. But people on both sides actually saw neighbors killing each other in front of these. So uh, we, I haven't, I've heard about it, but one and a half year later, my old friend, Marc Levitt from France, uh, begins to be interested in the art of hosting practice, uh, which he had heard of. We used to work together and doing big conferences across the planet and we're friends and colleagues. And he says, I've got an invitation from a group of people in Cote d'Ivoire uh, headed or, you know, the, uh, the invitation comes from Kofi, uh, Amani Kofi, he's a 75-year-old elder, and he used to be the uh, uh, city director of Abishan. So he had some uh, stature with people, and he somehow began to bring people together who had been on both sides, but they had decided they didn't want to fight any longer, and they wanted to begin to, to you know, find peace together and harmonize. And they had seen that in the political attempt to create, that had, had, you know, a, 
peace and reconciliation uh, uh, process going on, similar to what happened in South Africa earlier. But this was a political, uh, you know, hot air kind of thing, and nothing came out of it. So Kofi contacts Mark and says, you do meetings, you don't, you know how to work with people. Could you come and help us bring, you know, people together from, you know, and reconciliation for real. I, we don't know what to do, but we are 30 people. We come from different contexts, but we have made a decision that we want to shift this, but we just don't know how. Mark asks me, uh, and he says, maybe we could use some of this out of hosting, hosting stuff that, you know, so he comes to an out of hosting training here in Denmark. And uh, we do on the third day, the designing for Visa action, he brings up this project. And I remember Ibrahim and uh, 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 the other guy from Israel, people Eden. I worked with in, uh, yes, uh, I worked with there. Uh, they were at that out of hosting training. We had brought them out of the Middle East to come for the training. And they joined his group and Monica and I joined his group. So he, we began to decide this, what could we do for 30 people who wanted to begin to influence their, their society, but starting with themselves first. So um, to make it short, um, in January 2013, we are invited by them. Uh, we pay our own way there, uh, but they take care of us while we are there. We said, at least we don't want to have expenses there. Uh, but this was not, uh, um, this was work done from the heart. And we made certain important decision that I want to share with all of you. First is, we realized these 30 people were not asking to be trained in the art of hosting and becoming facilitators. They were looking for peaceful coexistence and well-being for themselves and their people in the country. And they had actually created an association with that purpose. Interestingly, that is the purpose of the European Union. Peaceful coexistence and well-being for all. So somehow, I don't know if they'd heard about that or this was just, but it, this is the ancient purpose showing up. And so we were working with a clarity of purpose, but they had no idea or interest in becoming facilitators or hosts, you know, for their profession or anything. They came from all kinds of walks of life. Um, and so we decided to create the design that may work. And you will be experiencing some of the design uh, after the storytelling here. What we came up with was a three and a half hour process and we, we just, created it, Mark and I, with whatever inspiration we could get from life. And basically a circle check-in, an appreciative inquiry, no, a little inspirational video from a, 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 one of the ambassadors of peace who, who were, you know, uh, inspiring us all to, uh, to take peace seriously. Little video clip, and then this conversation uh, that uh, basically had a beautiful little rhythm. Share a story of where you have practiced peace with someone that you might have been in conflict with or been an enemy to. What are the conditions that made that possible? And what do you dream possible? If you all, each of us, practice a little bit more peace every day. So these questions, I... I remember they sort of just landed on our design paper in a very gentle way, but it's of course basically real uh, appreciative inquiry design. Um, and then we harvested it. So we go there and we create a four hour process, four day process. First day we run the, the, this design with them to see if it works. They have a really profound experience. These are the 30 people. In the end of the day, we say, uh, part of our design, and they knew about this already, is that we are going to have a conversation with people that you have invited on the third day. This is the first day. 
who of you would like to be trained to run that conversation, host it and harvest to see if it works with more people who are not part of your group. Five people stepped up. Next day, we taught them to check in circle, the appreciative inquiry process, how to harvest, how to do a checkout circle. And uh, so the five people became the hosting team. In the end of the day, we're ready. The third day in the morning, they run the, you know, uh, 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 35 people arrive with the 30. So there's a, there's a circle of 65 people. Mark and I are participating. They are hosting it. And in the end of the day, uh, or in the end of the, the morning, um, something else is happening. <laughs> and these are people who have been at different sites. Something has taken place. And we witnessed to see that they were actually experiencing through the storytelling, through the harvesting, through the listening, you know, in, in a, uh, in a uh, invited fashion <laughs> to be disciplined about listening, using a talking piece and so forth. And then seeing their conditions and seeing their dreams, uh, a transformation had taken place that uh, were Im impressed us all. The fourth day, any of the 30 could step up and call another conversation they would do in the next six months. Five stepped up, we did the signing for Visa Action, supported them and uh, within uh, seven months, uh, or in within the, those six months, they had run eight of these uh, in the in you know some with politicians, some in villages, the arts community because one of them was a musician, so they had actually been able to initiate this, and the feedback that came was this is actually working, and I will share a little bit later on because we then went back. Six months later in August 2013 because now they wanted us to train them. 12 of them had said we want to be able to train other people how to do this. So we did a second level capacity building and as we arrive we are also told that seven of the traditional chiefs of the country who are the trusted leaders in this very ancient culture wanted to meet with us because they had seen this. They had you know, had these conversations happening uh, in their territories. These were the chief in the middle, the chief of the north, the chief of the south, the chief of the west. Wonderful, wonderful uh, old uh, 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 gentle chiefs who had the well-being of their people and not their political career um, at, at heart. And I'll leave the rest till, till later on in the call of what has taken place. But it was a beautiful moment uh, for us to meet uh, the and sit in circle with the chiefs. And there was a beautiful one, I'll end with that maybe uh, as time is moving on. But Mark was very, very, very nervous to sit with the chiefs. Why? Because he's a white male. And these were not white, but he's also from the colonizing country of France. And France had colonized Cote d'Ivoire. So as the talking piece goes around, so, and I had, I, I did something that I've never done before in my life. I told the people who invited me to these conversations. I said, I said, would you want to meet with these chiefs? This is a great honor to meet with them and there's certain protocol. But I realized I had to meet them as an equal without fear. So I remember saying, I will show up as a chief too. I'm a chief of the Danish tribe and uh, uh, I, I don't have any other title, but you know, I would meet them as equals if that is fine. And also that we could be in circle and use a talking piece so every voice can be heard. 
So we meet, talking peace comes around. When it comes to Mark, he's trembling and he's beginning to apologize. And the chief of chiefs says, Mr. Mark, I know you're from France. They were the colonizers. This is your people. But now we have to move on. Now we're here together. Let's work for peace now and into the future. And all of that, you know, we have forgiven. At least you have not had anything to do with it. So we moved on. They asked us to say, we are not coming here to support you. We want to learn how to do this ourselves. And in the, then we had a sandwich and a cup of tea. And suddenly one of the chiefs says, he says, you know, probably every human being on the planet, not just in Cote d'Ivoire, just wants peace for himself and his family and his village. And there was such a moment, it's like it was vibrating. And it comes out of my mouth, yes. But the problem is we have forgotten that that's what we all want. And then we all began to laugh, like I hadn't laughed for a long time. Just the heart just exploding in this little insight. Now this has traveled into the army, into universities, into many, many villages. I can share more a little bit later on. Thank you so much. So there you have the, the kernel of the story. We'd like to offer you an opportunity to experience this very simple process. So in the chat window, Ben is going to paste the instructions. Let me just speak you through those. We're going to be in trios. If we have an odd number of people, there will be maybe one or two fours. Um, but there are three roles in this little exercise, the storyteller, the harvester, and the witness. And each of you will play each of those roles over the 30 minutes we're going to be together. So the storyteller, the invitation to them is share a story about a moment where you have practiced peace with somebody who you may have been in conflict with, or you may even have considered an enemy. What conditions made that possible? The person who's the harvester is going to be listening carefully and harvesting the essences of this from the story. What were the conditions that made that possible? And the witness is going to be the person who asked the question so that the storyteller can respond. So we're going to have 30 minutes in total. We're suggesting eight minutes for each storyteller and uh, having the harvester report back what they have, what they've harvested and uh, three minutes to harvest the conditions together. So five minutes for the storyteller, three minutes to harvest the conditions. And then in the final six minutes, please decide on the two most powerful conditions from the stories you've heard that help to create peace. And you're going to paste them or put them using post-it notes on the jam board. So there you have the conditions and the, the, the context there, the trios uh, Ben has pasted in and also the link to the jam board. So you're going to go into a breakout room for 30 minutes with three of you and the last six minutes harvesting onto the jam board and then we'll take a look at those together when we come back. If you need help, remember there's a little help button. You can press the help button and Ben or me or someone else will respond to you in your trios. And if you are there for your, by yourself for a moment, just wait. Others may be hanging in the atmosphere to kind of gently land for a moment. So wait for a moment before you try coming back. Anything else you want to say, Ben, about... Ben is our tech fairy, so he's going to tell you about... <laughs> the tech fairy is magically going to give you a room. But what else, Ben? Anything uh, else? You'll have a countdown timer in the upper right-hand corner of your breakout window. We'll also flash some little broadcast messages on the top to give you some guidelines on the timing. Um, and then you'll get a one minute warning and a big blue button will pop up saying you have one minute press to return to the main room. Don't press the button, use the last minute together. Um, if you do, you know, you'll just be abandoning your comrades there. Um, and if for some reason the trios right now, it all has worked out, but, but maybe there's somebody who drops off as soon as we get into those. So we, we may do a little bit of shuffling as you get started here to, to make sure all the groups are good. But I think with that, we're ready to start. Happy story sharing, everybody.
Yeah, is there, yeah, I think we are good. All right, here we go. So everybody, welcome back from your trios. We hope you uh, felt inspired and connected to the others in your group. And we're looking forward to a little bit of a group conversation about what are the two most powerful conditions for practicing peace from your stories. So I want to invite Toka also to step in here as a conversation host too, and invite you to share some of the conditions you found out about in your stories. So you can either just volunteer to speak up or you could also raise your hand by going to the participants tab and showing participants or and clicking there, raise, raise your hand or going to the three dots at the top of your image and clicking raise hand there. So who has something to share from their stories? What did you learn about conditions for practicing peace? May I share? Yes, Carla. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the two stories I heard, it, uh, they have in common um, a different path um, towards uh, inner truth uh, and inner respect and inner love. And this is, I think it's, um, it's every, conf every conflict uh, brings this invitation, I think to every part of the conflict to get in touch with its wits or their own truth, their own self-respect. And this is a major potential for every conflict. So if it doesn't matter how long it takes, if we are able to um, find our truth, our inner truth and share it with the group or with the other part of the conflict, that will bring, that will bring peace. Thank you. You're Lucy, welcome. you had your hand up. Absolutely, thank you. Um, the one we had was really around courage, to show courage, you know, you, you need to step in the arena and be there and, and, and speak to the person. And I see that other people have, have put courage too. And this idea to ask an open question, which could be, how are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? To, to make that human connection with the other person, the baby step. Yeah, thank you. Aman, you had your hand raised. Um, I'll just unmute myself. Yes, so, uh, so, so this is slightly weird, but uh, you know, two things that came in our conversation. One was a threat of a bigger evil led to a peace. So initially, you know, the story that Tani mentioned, again, I won't go into details, but there's a conflict between the local people and the local police. But then the federal police came in and they thought, hey, that is a bigger evil. So they thought uh, uh, it's better to have uh, kind of uh, uh, be friendly with the local police rather than uh, have the threat of the bigger evil. So that really led to the peace. Uh, so that was one takeaway. Sometimes that works. And second is, uh, second story that, you know, frank, frankly, I was able to relate to was the collective voice of uh, people. So uh, there could be somebody who might think that they are right. But when the collective voice of people comes in uh, and then, you know, the, 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 uh, the, um, the violence has to step down and then, then the peace prevails when everybody comes together collectively and raises their voice. So I think these are two takeaways uh, from our discussion. Rhiannon. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we didn't manage the, the jam board because it was felt more important to be with the, 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 the story we were being with. So, but I think from the stories we shared, this one is, is one important bit is the inner resilience, you know, to have some sort of inner, inner strength to, which is a bit like in Toka's story, learning the jujitsu is just doing something to how I am. And then sometimes that helps the conflict. 
and the other bit is is getting to know each other you know actually knowing the common elements the bits where we are actually all the same so if i know something about about you and actually suddenly you seem like the enemy but actually you're going through the same experiences as me so having this space to share and to find out about our different ways that are actually so similar mm -hmm. and not enemies thank you claire you have something um yes thank you um stating and sharing the obvious is something that I realized from sharing my story and reflecting back on it, that um, in a conflict, I was a lifelong conflict with my sister based, was based on some basic assumptions that were misunderstood by each other. And so I almost didn't bother saying something in, in a sort of conflict resolution conversation that we were having, which she would never call that. Um, because I thought, well, this is so obvious. Why would I say it? And she said something that for her was so obvious. Why would she need to say it? So she, she pointed something out. She goes, well, you know, I don't say those things. I don't want to hurt you. And I didn't literally didn't know that my experience was that she was trying to hurt me. So my assumption was she's trying to hurt me. She wouldn't have thought that because that wasn't what she thought she was doing. And for me to point out the obvious, which was for me, the obvious was, well, when you think something's funny, sometimes for others, in my case, me, that actually hurts. Your sense of humor hurts my feelings. And for her, that was completely unknown but they're so close to our skin as ways of being and ways of understanding a reality that it becomes sort of immortalized and therefore you, it, it's it could i could easily not have said it she could easily not have said it and that that was a big shift in an ongoing process you know so mm -hmm. state state the obvious because it might not be obvious to the other person Thank you. Alex. Well, something that came out of, out of our groups was that uh, we can make peace if we are in the, in the panic zone. If we are afraid, it's very difficult to do some positive steps toward peace. And the other is uh, uh, accept that, uh, let go of the expectation that we can change the other person. We are not changing the other person. We have to accept that the, the, the other person is what it is uh, in the moment and maybe is not going to change because of us. Thank you. Thank you. So Toka, can I invite you maybe to comment on, on what you've heard and to also tell us where this project is at now? Yes. Well, <clears throat> what's filling my consciousness uh, at the moment is, first of all, thank you. It's really, uh, you know, the way that this harvest is coming forth feels real in my heart. This is out of our stories. And I think that the, the one, uh, Thing. I ended up uh, in a little wonderful group with Mache, uh, just the two of us, and we were sharing uh, with each other the importance of personal practice, which was expressed in, in, in one of the things that one of you were offering, that those inner truths that, you know, being yourself is not a thought, it's not an idea. <laughs> but remembering the human being in ourselves, however we get to it. And these personal practices uh, are many, but um, it's important in, in art of hosting, we call it hosting yourself first. 
or finding your own inner strength so that you can actually be, because it looks like, you know, in the story I was sharing with Matya that, you know, we were trembling, Mark and I, as we arrived in Cote d'Ivoire. He knew some of those people had never met them. We didn't know what kind of conflict was still there. So, you know, but what made it possible for us to walk in there was our own personal practices, our friendship, and also that we sincerely wanted to be of service to that situation. So there's something about sincerity, personal practice, and being real. And then thank you for one of the other things that was offered, you know, not trying to fix other people. Do you realize, friends, that peace is, you know, peace is an experience, first and foremost, that we can have, you know, we were born with that. Look at any little child, they emanate peace, joy, uh, love. It's our nature. But we put so much on top or we think ourselves away from it. So I think any practice that can take us back to it, remembering your breath, being quiet, you know. Seeing the beauty. There's beauty everywhere in the midst of, you know, remember. Yeah, anyway. And then, uh, <laughs> and this is, I think, where our our work, Ma, has so beautifully combined over the years that this, you know, creating conditions for stories to be told and heard from the heart. When Klaus told me that his father beat him up once a week, it was two years later. And I'd probably already forgiven him because he had become my friend. You know, friendship heals. And he also told me that the father was a police officer in the same corps, but he hadn't gone to my senses uh, uh, training sessions yet. I hope he did. I don't know what happened to him. But there's something about this stories, and I think part of what what the the the, the success of what we did there and it has gone on is that we didn't invite people into conversation about what they meant about the conflict, or we had no. We had been. We had worked on it for half a year, preparing ourselves and all of that. So we were quite cleaned out with all the false expectations that, or whatever we could have thought up that we were going to fix it. We just came there sincerely, created the conditions, and let people share stories about their own experiences. And we participated in it. We heard those stories, and then we we harvested this. Now. If you want to hear just a few things about what has happened since. We came half a year later, as I mentioned, and the chiefs uh, were, uh, after our little meeting, the 12 had already begun to train 40 people happening in the same venue. So we come out of the room and we invited the chiefs to go and meet those who had been trained and say, these are now people who can run these conversations with some kind of, you know, both certainly sincerity and they are learning how to do it and stepping into this. So you can invite them. And they began to invite them into the, uh, their, their areas to create more conversations. Now, when a traditional chief in West Africa invites people, people show up. So it, you could say they used their authority to invite people. But they, the next thing that happened was they actually created a similar set. We called these conversations, conversations for building peace. The chiefs, these seven, they, they hosted one for, for 500 chiefs. And, and they began to practice it themselves. And in that way, you own 
you earn the right and the authenticity to invite other people to it. You're not doing it unto others. You are investing yourself and your heart in it. And then they began to ask, so what, what, what is, uh, how can this follow, what could the follow up to this be? And so Mark is working with some other people in a program called the Peace Education Program, which is, which is a, a training in, in listening and, and finding that peace and understanding the importance of it. Now, one of you were bringing back, and I can see here that courage is really important. There's courage outside, and then there's the courage. Do I have the courage to decide that I want to walk in peace, with peace, and find inner peace in this world while the world is burning? This is the first courage. Do I really take peace seriously, or do I think I have to, I can practice peace when the world is at peace, or can I start with me while the world is burning? That takes a lot of inner courage, and a lot of people will tell you it's selfish. When, when I finally decided to, when I found a meditation practice that I stuck with, and I've stuck with it for 45 years, people were calling my mother and saying, your, your son is getting crazy. He's beginning to go into something very strange to find out who he really is. This is a very selfish thing. He might find out he's crazy. So you have to, you know, to, this is, a, you know, <laughs> peaceful warriorship is to, to not let people sway you away from your, what your heart knows and what your heart is hungry for. So this peace education program and these uh, uh, conversations for building peace, out of this meeting with the chiefs, there were generals from the army the influence of, of, of this peace education program and the understanding conveyed was that they realized, these generals, that they were not just there to create war when the politicians showed up. They were actually a peacemaking force. And so they, they, some of the leadership of the army in Cote d'Ivoire has begun to understand their role as peacekeepers rather than being instruments of violence and war. This is a huge thing. This is a paradigm shift. And from there, it's begun to move into uh, universities and, and other places. So it's still rippling. And I think part of the, the essence of this is really that we dared take the step to trust that every, anybody is really wanting peace and anybody could practice something for themselves and they could also take you know a model like this or a design like this which is of course not perfect but it's something and you can put it into practice in your own context when the invitation comes or maybe you also have the courage to make the invitation but there's something about I have traveled by invitation in the world I've never tried to market myself in anything and I've been brought to the most amazing places of power and influence. Uh, but I've been able to come as a human being, not as an identity. And uh, I think this is the time for inner and outer courage. And it's not two different, different things. It's just, you know, it exists. We have used this in, 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 uh, in Colombia, uh, we did uh, evolved something I called the Practicing for Peace Dojo. Um, Rowan and I did a three and a half day uh, dojo in Colombia after FARC surrendered. Uh, we brought it into many other places. I hope you have taken something from this that you can use in your own life, but don't forget the, your personal practice because everything else depends upon it. And, uh, and then, of course, be in good company with... We are millions and millions and millions of people. I think the instigators of war and the, the warmongers are actually really few. 
most people want peaceful coexistence for those you love. And when you realize you love has no boundary, there is love enough in each of us for everything. And it isn't to be released. Might not happen in this lifetime, you know. I'm, I'm not so concerned about the world peace. It will come, but I'm more concerned with what will we practice because what we practice, we will become. Yeah. Thank you for listening and, and, and being part of this. Uh, I, uh, it feels always worthy to, to spend time uh, experiencing understanding and finding deeper commitment to be walking in and with peace in the world and together. Thank you very much, Toka. Um, Carlotta, I wanna just ask you whether you have something you wanna share from your visual harvest at this point in time. Sure, I can share my screen if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So it's not finished because I, I want to make some more illustrations, but I Let me say we were always so impressed by what graphic harvesting can bring and what, what you're bringing right now and the fact that people try to do it this quickly. Wow. Yeah, I would like to be made host if it's possible. Co-host, sorry, because I cannot share right now. If the tech uh, fairy can do that. Yes. yes. No. no. Mm -hmm. Still nothing. It says only the host can share in this meeting. You might have to reset it, Ben. Again. Okay, now yes. Thank you, Ben. So, yeah. So you can see that. So I'm going to go through it from the start. Mm just uh, very quickly. And this is our check-in with some keywords that I captured and the question. Then the story of Toke, starting from uh, the 14 days of unfortunate being bullied and beaten up to the discovery of Jiu-Jitsu and the seed of power. And uh, when he discovered that he could uh, not be afraid and befriend the enemy. And the three keys uh, that I heard about personal practice, learning to trust, and the keys to wisdom, don't offend, don't get offended, and do not take revenge. And then we went into the story of uh, practicing peace in our coast. That was really interested, uh, interesting. I didn't uh, hear that story yet. So I really liked it and, and I was trying to find the actual clothing of the chiefs. So I will have to tweak them a little. They look like more like angels than chiefs. I will send you uh, some photos, uh, uh, Carlotta. They yeah. had incredible clothes. Thanks. Yeah, I would really like to see those. And then here are some things that I captured from what was shared. Uh, and I will probably finish to illustrate that with some drawings but this is what I captured until now. So, can I Wonderful. stop? Sharing? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. So right now we wanna invite you to write in the chat window, what do you dream possible for yourself and your community or your country or the human race if we all practice a little more peace every day? What do you dream possible? So I'm gonna just take this as a little litmus test. For those of you who wanna to continue to stay with us, we wanna just spend the, the last half an hour of our time being in conversation, whichever direction you wanna take that. If you thought originally our, our time was 90 minutes, then this is a time for you to check out with this question. Um, ben has put in the chat window, what do you dream possible for yourself and your community? country, the human race, if we all practiced a little more peace every day. What do you think? Of 
cooperation and community, a world without conflict, sharing resources, practicing kindness. Healthier and happier, more and better connections. One step at a time, I dream of conversations being held in the streets, breaking down barriers, compassion to self. That everyone will get into conflicts with more awareness of violence will cease. In the US, a healing, healing a moral repair between the dominant culture, indigenous peoples and African-Americans as a beginning, less suffering, more balanced world, happier humanity. Oh, may it be so, may it be so being friends with our earth, healthy ways of teaching intimacy and sex education with youth and children, innovations of all kinds. Just want to remind you too that uh, Otto Sharma has just released a very interesting blog post where he actually talks about some of the levels of violence and one of them is attentional violence when we don't pay attention to people. That is also a violent act. So it's interesting to think much deeper about what violence really means. Less divisions. Thank you, everybody, for that. Our harvesting team is going to, to take a look at this and uh, see if they can craft something out of your contributions here. We will test that. They've also been working on the jam board to see if they can do some clustering of what you uh, popped out as some of your key conditions. So we will also feed that back to you. If you uh, poke the button that said subscribe when you signed up for this, you'll get an email with some of the links and, and other materials. Let me know if you didn't and you want to make sure you got that, please send me a private chat so I've got your email address and details. But let's open up for the last 20 minutes of our time together um, and ask Toka, is there anything else you want to say? And is there anything you want to ask Toka or be in conversation with or anything you'd like to surface right at the moment about the concept of practicing peace or using stories to help with transforming conflict? Let's just open the floor. You can either raise your hand or just speak up. I see Sabine. Well, what came to my mind just before already in the round with the harvesting is that it might be also so that we are, we need the, in a way the, sorry, English is not my first language. I'm struggling right now. Um, that we need the capacity to sit with each other in the discomfort, which means that we are not only entering com in conversations um, that are goal oriented. And that for me makes such a big difference towards uh, peace, especially during those times now where we can't come up with quick solution and quick fixes. We just need to be able to sit with each other in pain and despair and um, not knowing and that makes a peace practice worth doing and that that's why i'm so in love with storytelling midi you have your hand raised yes i'm very touched and moved um by the the spirit and energy of this session um, I feel a, a real congruence between the way um, the session has unfolded since I joined it and the theme of the session. Uh, this is, I feel very in, in, intensely in this moment a spirit of peace and of people practicing peace together. And I thank you so much for this. Deb. Great conversation. Thank you. I'm not going to remember this quote exactly, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. Something to the effect of peace is more than the absence of war. It is the well-being of all. Thank you. Um, 
so i think i would uh, i did capture i did uh, took notes what uh, dr talked about and i hope i will go back again and hear more stories from his journey i'm sure uh, will uh, will be very helpful uh, for me in my own journey in understanding the conflict and peace uh, i feel i have a question in the sense which is uh, um i'm going through personally and maybe is there is there any way uh toka has some uh, some uh advice suggestion that we talk about diversity in teams and uh, so let's say we are working in actually a space where uh there is a perpetrator and victim and and to give an example of two countries and uh, how do we invite both parties onto the same table in the same group when we are working and uh, and it is actually uh, just happened and uh, and so if you have any advice because the uh, the person from a country a feels that if i am inviting if the group is inviting somebody from the country b then we are hurting the sentiments of that person uh so maybe uh uh if there is something which uh, toka has to has to offer in this case of these kind of complex uh, conflict uh which might happen to many of us in uh, when we are working in uh, uh, in organizations or maybe when we are trying to do something good for the uh world thank you uh i don't uh i don't know if i have an answer for you uh because each context is different but there's something about how i i am invited will determine how i am showing up so i'm thinking about the moment that i overcame myself to invite the perpetrator to my home for tea being 10 years old and he came then he must have been trembling i'm thinking about moments uh, when i worked in the west bank in israel palestine with palestinians and israelis who have hurt each other the people have hurt each other and the people who invited me to go and bring this uh, and the other practices there uh, I went for four years in a row to initiate a practice field where these kind of meetings and conversations could come together that the palestinians were inviting other who trusted us invited other palestinians even some israelis who were trusted by some palestinians would invite palestinians and israelis were inviting israelis but their families and friends called them traitors when they realized they were going to a meeting to meet the enemy so i don't know um if this has any you know clarity or answer for you but the, my 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 consciousness is is been called to the to the sincerity and the heart of the invitation how that relates in your context you will have to see the second piece of it is you know so at heartfelt invitation i is that i can come to a place where i can invite without judgment 
So that is inner work. Being detached, even if the person would say, no, I won't come. I have, if I come from my sincere heart, the, the deep, the child in me who will exist until I die, if I keep him alive, or another person will feel it even if he think I am his enemy. If I come from that place, it's a very strong, gentle power, invitation from the heart. Now, second piece is to make sure that what I'm inviting to will be safe for my enemy or for the other, that I'm not inviting him into something where suddenly he will feel. I remember sitting in uh, hosting a circle with half Israelis, half Palestinians. And one of the, when we did a circle check-in, the Palestinian, no, the, one of the, the Israelis, uh, he was a um, uh, uh, part of the uh, Mossad, but he was not there as, you know, intelligence officer. He was there because he didn't want to be an enemy to the Palestinians, those he had been doing Mossad kind of work behind the scenes. And he's a lovely man. He's one of my very close friends. He's very sincere. He gets the peace and he says, I am in this moment trembling because you Palestinians are sitting over there. You have your jackets on. I don't know if you have bombs underneath. But I am here trusting my friend Toka and my other friend, you know, uh, um, Ibrahim Issa, who is, who is the other part of the Indian. You know, he and the Ibrahim have been the key inviters. I trust that you carry no bombs. And I'm sincerely here because I want to get to know you because I don't believe that we have to be enemies for the rest of our lives. And then this young man that he was looking at, he just opens his chest and says, it's just my heart pumping. So, you know, what are the weapons of peace, my friend? Sincerity. Have a clear heart. You may not know the solution, that's fine. But, you know, this is why we called it the art of hosting originally. Hosting is the ancient hospitality, kindness that we are born with. And when you invite from the heart, the, the heart that you invite will feel it. And you can cut through some of that bullshit, some of that judgment, some of that, even hurt, hurt, hurt. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm a seeker for the weapons of peace. We have created a thousand weapons for destruction, tanks and bombs, and every day a new terrible weapon is being created. Go hunting for the weapons of peace or the, the, the gentle uh, uh, practices of peace. Not gesture, practice. That's what I can offer you. I hope whatever you are doing, you know, can be. So if you're also inviting to something, so that is the third level that when people come together, that you create some, whether you use whatever you tried tonight or some other thing, but that you create something that we can meet on equal ground, that the human being in all of us would be surfaced, not the superficial animosity that we have gotten confused by. I think something else too that you, we've often talked about is um, inviting people from as a person rather than as their role or as their uh, stance or as their concept. But how do we invite the human to show up? I remember that's one thing Monica said the, the many times as we were talking about art of hosting that the most important thing I bet she would draw a little heart on the page. There's nothing else on the page. And she would say the most important thing is it comes from a good place. And 
from there, you just keep practicing. And every moment is a moment to practice for the next time. So I think the other thing that keeps us stuck so often is I have to get it right. Our Western society is kind of formed around, I have to get it right, I have to know the right answer, I have to do it right. I think that's the whole challenge right now in our, in our racial issues of I'm worried about getting it wrong. The point is you have to get into it, and keep doing the work. So there's something about emotional resilience we have going on here too. Are there other comments anyone else would like to make or contributions of yes. your thought right now? Go Mary for it. Alice. Oh. Can I, I just want to tag on to the end of what you just said, uh, because it came to mind. It's not that, that stressor, the I must get it right, what comes with that, coupled with it so closely, is, and I have to do it on my own. In other words, forgetting that the peace process is a collaboration, and that if we come forwards into it in the spirit of collaboration, then it changes the way we language what we say and and i think creates um like you're both holding the bowl together and, and that's a very different um that that's just a really different sensation mm -hmm. thank you I want to turn to our harvest team right at the moment and ask the, these are the the we have a tech fairy and then we have the harvesting fairies so they're also been dancing around on the head of a pen behind the scenes. Is there something you would like to report back having looked at both the Jamboard and what people put in the chat window around there, the possibilities, what are they dream is possible? Um, we, we have been lost in the richness of what we have harvested and we have been mesmerized by that. So let's see, I mean, uh, then Marcia, so we, we have we have shared something there. But let's see. Yes, let me see. I think I think I will start um, reading a little bit from where we got now. We were trying to take everyone's words and feelings and sentiments of the world that we dream that could be possible. Um, and what might be possible for our community, our country, the human race, if we all a little more peace every day. And um, let's see. Desire for peace. I will read a little bit now, and Hendrik and Janus, please feel free to step in when you feel like it. And we'll see. Desire for peace is nothing new. It has always been a part of me. And if we all practice a little more peace every day, we might have less suffering and more joy, more happy moments shared with people, cooperation, community, connection, awareness, and compassion to self, others, and nature. We might have world without conflict and conversations being held on the street, breaking down barriers, a world I incarnated to stand for. Human beings seeing themselves and all other human beings, self-healing clusters of living beings. We would build capacity to sit with each other with discomfort and not knowing and we would nurture physical well-being from a holistic perspective. If we all practice a little more peace every day, everybody will get into conflicts with more awareness, so violence will decrease. We might have more joy and laughter, more empathy, more energy being given to what we deeply want to see in the world. We'd be sharing resources and practicing kindness We'd be healthier and happier. We'd have more and better connections with others and heal a moral repair. Between a life, we'd have a life worth living and a healthy form of interdependence, supporting all life, more human connection. A more balanced world, happier. Happier humanity, happy nature, happy relations, 
and less time stuck in painful and helpful emotions and narrative cycles. Happy families, children learning how to navigate conflicts in schools and families. Healthy ways of teaching intimacy and sex education with youth and children and equal and equitable relations. We be friends with our herbs and take care of it together. We see a healing of trauma with time for more time for synergy. And if we practice a little peace every day, we'd have happiness and more laughter and a mutual learning mindset. And we'd be able to live together with all the differences. Hendrik, I'm wondering if you want to speak, read a couple of last a generative culture a new normal of speaking to the things that are below the surface and engaging in touch in tough conversation shutting down and just listening to what you already hold to be true a way of living that allows room for other life forms, the health of the biosphere and less consumption, a more global human connection. We will go through all, all these beautiful comments that you have shared uh, once more and put it together in a format that you will receive as part of the harvest in the days to come, as Nirella said. Um, it's, uh, if you sign up for the email list, you will get that. And we will also go once more for the gem board, which has been filled more and more. And uh, we will kind of see if we can uh, find some patterns and uh, see what uh, the focus areas have been in your conversations by clustering the post-its. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has, uh, was beautiful to listen to. And I highly can encourage you and encourage myself as well to keep on this practice and dive deeper so that we all become that peace that we envision and see possible. Thank you, Harvesting Team. Thank you, Carlotta, for your graphics. Thank you, Choka, for the story and for your practice that has been these many years a, a guiding light for so many of us in this field. Thank you all for being here. Each one of you can host conversations that help to practice peace, and those people can practice, and those people can practice, and the ripple might have started just here. That's a wonderful thing to think about. Before you leave, will you write in the chat window what you're taking away with you from our time together today? And we'd like to farewell you and say, wonderful, thank you so much. Can we open all the microphones, please, and just say goodbye to each other in whatever way you'd like to do that? And whenever you write in the chat, one of that's fine. Thank you so much for your time today. Deus, tudo bom. Beijinhos. Até breve. Tchau. So nice to be here. Thank you. Oh, oh, see you later. Oh, beijinhos. Bye. 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 Bye.